Elsit and the flea. Some people have this idea that if you like to stay inside, there must be something wrong with you. As an indoor person, I find that unfair. Plenty of pets are indoor pets. Lots of plants are indoor plants. No one gets on their case. Unfortunately, and was submit when the fresh air pollutes, meaning my mom and dad keep yelling. Paul, it's a beautiful day. Paul, go outside. Paul, make some friends. That another thing to me. I don't make friend easily. Some people can go right up to someone and say, "Want to play?" and they instantly got a best friend. Why would I go up to a total stranger and say, "Want to play? Play what?" Plus, outside there was always the dangers of running into the Pym brothers, Julius and Augustus. More about them later. It was the second week of summer vacation, with the July Fourth weekend looming ahead. I had finished my summer reading. I had ex- exhausted my video games. I was bored, and the fresh air police knew it. They wouldn't leave me alone. Maybe that's what caused me to make a serious tactical error. I asked my dad for some money to buy a new mighty atom CD room. I knew it was a mistake the minute my dad put his hand on my shoulder. Thirty dollars is a lot of money, Paul. He said as if I had just arrived in America. If you need that money, I suggest you go out and earn it. Then my mom chimed in. I was talking with Mr. Rose in apartment 6D. He's flying out to his niece's wedding, and he was, and he has to leave his dog here. He has desperate to pay someone to feed and walk his dog over the July Fourth weekend. If I were you, son, I'd snap at that opportunity," said my dad. So that's how I end up sitting in Mr. Rose's. Kitchen with a plate of stale cookies and milk. I I munch a cookie. I thought it's not too late. I can just get up and go out the door and poof, no job. But I could hear the junk jingle of dogs dog tags getting closer, and I guess I was kind of curious. I almost choke on the ch- cookies as the biggest dog in the universe came trotting into the kitchen. It was all white, maybe three feet tall, with a big woolly chest. It was as if someone were trying to pass off a polar bear as a dog. This Elsie said, "Mr. Rose, sit. Say, how do you do?" The giant polar bear. Rumped and held up a pole the size of a catcher mitt. I figured I was supposed to shake it, so I did. Sit is a great parentis, Mr. Rose explained. There is a sheep herding dogs in Spain and France. Yes, they are, he said, burying his face to the dog's fur. He seemed to think he'd say everything they need that needs to be said. I thought Mr. Rose was overlooking an obvious problem. It has to do with my height. I'm on the short side. Maybe only half a foot below average, but noticeably sailable when I'm standing next to something very big, like a great pyramid. It doesn't bother me, but it seemed to be an issue for a pain brothers who called me the flea. More about them later. I was about to tell Mr. Rose that his dog might be a little too big for me to handle, but then he cleared his throat and said, "So, shall we say one hundred dollars to blah blah blah?" To be honest, I didn't hear anything he said after one hundred dollars. Good for you, my parents said. As if I'd agree to do something incredibly, incredibly brave, when 
Actually, I was feeling kind of swept along my event, as if that hundred dollars were a little bottle. Say, hurry up, sir! Right this way. Mr. Roos took me on a dry run with Elsie, so the dog could get used to me, and I could get used to him. It went okay, but I didn't really have to do anything. I just watched while Mr. Roos showed me where the beefy chunks back was, and then walked me through the routes that he takes seat on every day. I probably should have gotten more involved, but that im- imaginary butler kept saying, "Right this way, sir. Right this way." The butler quite a er- Quite down long enough for me to ask if there was anything I should know about Elsie. It was a kind of throwaway question, but Mr. Rich looked down at the sidewalk and said, "Well, um, she didn't care for cats. That's okay. Most dogs don't." I point out. "She's terrified of them," he muttered. "What would you have done?" Would you have backed out then and there and said, "Sorry, Mister, your dog's too weird," or would you have listened to a hundred-dollar bottle full of agencies and saying, "Yes, sir, step this way, sir"? Well, I said, "I guess we'll just have to stay away from cats." The next day, I waved goodbye to Mister Roos. As he took off in his taxi, I have expected Elsie to go bolting after the cat, dragging me along behind him like a kite. That didn't happen. Here's what did happen. First, I noticed that the hundred-dollar bottle has disappeared, meaning it was suddenly me and this strange giant dog that I was now in charge of. I feel uneasy. I figured we better go for a walk, in case Elsie was feeling uneasy too. So here's the sh- short kick: me trotting behind these gargantuan great pyrenees, and passerby grinning at their sight, as if we were one of those joke photos in the newspaper with a funny caption, like "Who's walking whom." Plus, here's this indoor kid, also me, really out of my element, trying to follow this map of the roads that I had laboriously copied out the night before. Then, to cap it off, who should come sauntering out of a big kid comedy store in front of us but my enemies, Julius and Augustus Pym? I guess you could call them burlies. Julius, who was always short, but not as short as me, was the older and more generous one. Augustus was bigger and a little smarter. Julius looked as happy as if he'd just found ten dollars on the sidewalk. Check it out, Gus," he said. "A dog and a flea. My, I thought, was a greedy guy." Then Augustus said, "Where have you been, Flea? I we miss you." I think he was trying to sell us some sarcastic movie bad guy. I hate corny situations. The and this was sadly really corny. What was I supposed to say? I miss you too. Well, it turned out I didn't have to say anything. There was a wider ending to this scene. It、uh, was corny either. Someone co- come out of the pet store next to Big Kid Cummins, carrying a big furry orange cat. That cat took one look at Elsie and got ten times furrier. Then it made a sound like a jet taking off. This caused Elsie to do something very undog-like. Instead of looking at the do- cat, he fell backward on top of me. So there I was, buried under a big white furry avalanche. Then suddenly the mountain was gone, which was even worse, because it meant Elsie was galloping off somewhere, flapping his leash behind him. 
I was all aware of someone laughing like a loon, but the laughter faded I, as I ran. See it, I yell. I saw people turning their heads. Some of the people I passed before. I was listening to for a sound of brakes screeching, a long car horn, a second time. I was scared. But how could this comedy end in tragedy? Ah, it couldn't. It didn't. Just as I got to the end of the block, a huge white haystack of fuel came tumbling out of the taxido retail. Retold place, followed by a guy with a bush broom who was yelling at the top of his lungs about the dog hair getting all over his tuxedos. It was relief. I collect Elsie by his leash and decide to call it a day. Poor old dog, he was trembling all the way home. I thought it was interesting that we each ran into our worst nightmare, as just about the same time. For me, it was the pimps. For Sid, it was the cat. We had a lot of common. After I refilled Sid's bowl, I told him not to feel bad. It was a perilous world out there. I explained, and just sitting foot. And just setting foot into it was worth a pat on the back, so I gave him one, and I lifted one of his giant ice pistols and gave myself a pat too.